All right, we're live. Hello, everyone. Good morning or afternoon or evening if we have anyone other than our guests in Europe. Uh, we usually do, actually. You guys, it's crazy where we get people from and what time of day it is while they're signed on to our webinars. But um, this is episode two of our functional lab series here at Rebel Health Tribe. Uh, we're going to be talking about gut health today. And um, it's going to be really interesting. We've got an awesome presentation put together for you and two guests this time, and we'll do some Q&A after the presentation. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce our guests. You might be familiar with Graham. He's been on a podcast and a couple of webinars and things with us before. Graham Jones, clinical physiologist, uh, provides practitioner support for Nordic Laboratories, who uh, the test we're going to cover today comes from Nordic Laboratories. Graham? ran one of the largest private health screening hospital departments in the UK and has worked with many of London's leading doctors, surgeons, and functional medicine specialists. He lives now and works in Sweden with a range of practitioners, clients, and athletes all over Europe and the United States. He's also contributed a couple articles on our site, which you might have seen. And then new for you guys today is Umaro Cadigan, a functional medicine and nutrition specialist from Denmark and part of the Nordic Laboratories lecturing team as well. He's a consultant for numerous health companies and the Institute for Functional Medicine in the U.S., where he was one of the scientific editors of the textbook of functional medicine. He's also affiliated with the University of Western States as adjunct professor on their master's degree in nutrition and functional medicine, where he's helped develop the curriculum alongside teaching. So thank both of you guys for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. I and, do uh, <laughs> so I will be doing the presentation. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good middle of the night, wherever you happen to be on this planet. Hopefully, we don't have people chiming in from Mars or the Moon. You never know. Hey, they're they're um, invited to. But um, let's see if we can get this going. So I will share my screen because what I'm going to do is I'm literally going to draw my way through intestinal permeability and the testing. So I brought my digitizer. If you haven't experienced me lecture before, uh, you're in for a treat. So I'm going to draw and tell you, and we'll throw in some graphics. So the topic of today, of course, is intestinal permeability. And what is that? Uh, usually, of course, abbreviated IP. Well, if you look at your digestive system, say your small intestine, so if we were to draw sort of a diagram of the surface of the small intestine. Your small intestine, of course, you have cells that make up the lining, and they have this crazy job. They literally have to pick gold from a stream of shit. Pardon my language, but that's what they do, right? So you have nutrients, and then you have all the other stuff. And, of course, you want the nutrients to be absorbed, so through the cells you're going to pick up things like minerals, vitamins, trace elements, fatty acids, you know, all these nutrients you want, they're absorbed throughout the cells or, you know, paracellularly, uh, so through the cell, what intracellularly, so you can get them into the bloodstream. On the other hand, what you do not want are things that kind of leak through uncontrolled. So when you look at the surface of the small intestine, when things are cozy and healthy, there's not really any leeway for things to you know, make their way through in an uncontrolled manner because you're all closed up here. These are called tight junctions. So normally you could almost think of it like if you have a brick house, provided the house has been built properly, then there's nothing that can sort of slip in between the cracks um, between the bricks. And that way, you make sure that you have full control of what you absorb. And if you think about it, when you look at your gastrointestinal system, right, we're looking at a 400 square meter surface area. So if you take the uh, mucous membranes and the epithelium of your stomach, your small intestine, large intestine, we're looking at 400 square meters, which is like two tennis courts, that sort of surface area. So that's by no means, or I mean, by, by any means, that's the largest contact area we have with the outside world. That's our biggest barrier or border, so to speak. And along these 400 square meters of gut surface, you have 
somewhere between 1.5 and 2 kilograms of microbes, so that's you know, something like 3 to 4 pounds. You might have several pounds of food in there that could potentially be allergenic. And then, of course, when microbes start turning over this food and they start metabolizing it, you also get all sorts of metabolic byproducts. Some of them, of course, are highly beneficial, but some of them are also extremely toxic. So part of what's necessary for gut health, and because gut health is co connected with so, so many other parts of your body for general health, is to make sure that you do not have increased intestinal permeability. In other words, that you have this ability to actively and purposefully absorb nutrients, but you're not seeing things that slip in between the cracks, because if you get in the situation where you have unwanted things slipping through the cracks, that's of course going to get you in all sorts of trouble. If you look at the surface of your, so let's just copy this diagram and throw it in here, into a drawing. If you look at the surface of your small intestine and then look at the interaction with the immune system, right? You have lots of immune cells here, so more than 50% of your immune cells are located along your digestive surface. And they are constantly have looking at what's going on here. So once you start having things that can sort of leak through uncontrolled, you're going to have a massive antigen load. You're going to have lots of foreign molecules that will get the attention of your immune system and will thus start reacting. So usually people think of, well, you might have an infection. So let's say you get salmonella, right? That would induce inflammation. But if there's increased in intestinal permeability, so you have cracks in the lining, so to speak, and you have these molecules that happen to slip through un in an uncontrolled manner, that's going to trigger the immune system. So the moment you get increased intestinal permeability, that in a worst case scenario will literally turn your gut surface, your gut microflora, and all the contents of your gut into something that will drive increased inflammation and increased immune activation. Even though the things might be benign on their own, but the moment you can't control that area and you don't can't really sort of separate between external and internal, that's going to cause inflammation of some sort, which of course might initially start in your gut, but as we all know, once you have gut inflammation, with time that can easily become a systemic issue. So um, you know, so so, and once you get a systemic issue with inflammation, chronic sort of low-grade systemic unspecific inflammation, that can lead to all sorts of problems. Um, so you can think of more or less any sort of disease or health problem we know of, and chronic inflammation is usually part of that. Um, therefore, making sure that you maintain intestinal, um, you know, structure, and you do not get increased permeability is of utmost importance. And of course, there are all sorts of things that can cause increased permeability. So what sort of things might actually start causing damage to the surface of your stomach or small intestine, leading eventually to increased permeability? And then you have this scenario of uncontrolled immunogenic substances that will sort of pass through into, you know, through the gut surface and trigger your immune system. So we know that stress will actually do it. So if you're very stressed, that on its own can increase intestinal permeability. That, it's not just mental stress, but actually physical stress seems to do it as well. So if you look at people who do some of these extreme um, endurance events, like an Ironman, a triathlon, a marathon, do a stage of the Tour de France, or the Vuelta Espanas, or the Italia, that on, that on its own will usually double intestinal permeability. In other words, the physical stress of Doing something like that, that's where you're looking at exercise and physical activity way beyond what's necessary for health, causes enough physiological and neurological stress that you'll actually get increased permeability. So all of a sudden, so you have stuff that leak, leaks through from your gut, and you get immune activation, and also some of these things you absorb, of course, might cause all sorts of other metabolic disturbances on their own. But of course, stress is far from the only thing. Sleep deprivation, too much alcohol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can do it. Infections, of course, 
dysbiosis. So one thing is an outright infection like Salmonella or Campylobacter, but also dysbiosis where you get these alterations in gut microflora that aren't quite bad enough to be seen, you know, look like a real inf infection, but they're still way um, different than normal. So that will do it. Um, of course, if you just eat like uh, a high junk food diet, that on its own can do it um, as well. Or if you eat lots of overcooked, overprocessed foods, that will do damage as well. Uh, and if you sort of eat a pro-inflammatory diet, of course, a lot of these things overlap. So all these things can trigger um, increased intestinal permeability. Also, lack of certain nutrients, uh, nutrient deficiencies. So we know there are several nutrients that are really important for the gut surface. Zinc, of course, vitamin A is important. Several of the B vitamins are quite important. L-glutamine, highly important as well. Uh, and actually, glucosamine, not glucosamine, the sort of glucosamine for your joints, but other types of glucosamine, usually liberated by probiotic bacteria and created by probiotic bacteria. They're important. And probiotic bacteria, probiotics on their own, also help in, you know, increase intestinal integrity and decrease intestinal permeability. Um, a lack of omega-3 fatty acids also seems to cause problems as well. So there are plenty of um, nutrients that are really important for the gut surface as well. And of course, prebiotics, um, as long as you don't have small intestinal overgrowth of bacteria, also generally seems to enhance intestinal integrity and therefore lower intestinal permeability. And of course, once you get to the point, if you have increased intestinal permeability, um, so if that goes up, then you have the problem with inflammation locally and systemically, which then leads to all sorts of issues. And local inflammation, of course, will translate into gut problems, but systemically, of course, we are looking at so many things. We're looking at autoimmunity, atopic disease, neurological and psychiatrical health. Um, we're looking at problems with insulin sensitivity and blood sugar regulation, increased fat deposition, increased sympathetic drive, so more a higher stress response as well. Um, right. So systemically, once you get to that point, the cat's out of the box. Now, of course, the question is, how in the world do you measure intestinal permeability? How do you get an idea whether the scenario looks like this? where you have proper closed tight junctions so nothing can get through, right? Except, of course, what you absorb through the cells, or if you have a scenario where, due to various reasons, you have things leak through outside your control. Um, and so one way to do that is to have people ingest things that normally are not absorbed, and then test their urine and see. So things like, and I'll get, we'll get into more detail, but things like cellobios, which is a disaccharide that you're normally not able to digest and normally won't absorb. So if you give people cellobios, and, and it, it seems to turn up in urine, which it normally won't, then the only way that can happen is because the cellobios was absorbed outside your own control and got into your bloodstream and into your body. And then, of course, you try to um, get rid of it by excreting it through urine. So literally, the way one way to, to test whether there's increased intestinal permeability is to have people uh, do a urine sample about eight hours after you give them all these tracer molecules that normally will not be absorbed, and then see if any of those turn up in urine. And if they do turn up in urine, then that's a clear indication that there is a, a problem with intestinal permeability. So that's really the, I mean, that's the, the basic way to do it. And so with the Nordic Labs IPA tests, so um, 
of course, said initially, right, we have Nordic laboratories that are an outfit that do all these functional medicine tests, and I do a lot of lecturing for them. The, the, you know, they have a test, and so really what we do is, and the easiest way is actually to grab a test result, then I'll talk you through it, what happens and what the different markers mean and how they relate to all this physiology. Five different markers are given. So mannitol is given to look for absorption capacity. The mannitol is a carbohydrate, a sugar, that is actually absorbed on purpose through cells in the small intestine. So the only of these markers you really want coming out in large amounts is mannitol. So if you give people mannitol in a you know, pre-testing, then you want lots of it to come out in urine because that's active absorption and it's wanted active absorption. So looking at the amount of mannitol will help you look at whether you, when you get into the small intestine, whether your ability to absorb nutrients is okay or impaired. If mannitol levels are high in urine, when you take a urine sample eight hours after drinking the tracer molecules, good. If it's low, then you have a problem because then you actually know there's sufficient damage in your small intestine inflammation or, or cellular damage that you're incapable of absorbing things actively that you want. So, with, you know, so for starters, when you look at a test result or, and when you look at mannitol, that will actually show you whether people have normal absorption capacity or not. And of course, if you get sufficient damage to the small intestine, then your ability to absorb nutrients will be impaired. And then you're in sort of a double trouble situation. In fact, now you're not able to pick any of the gold, you're just getting all the crap, right? Now the second thing that's measured in the test is cellobios, which isn't measured in that many other um, of the IPA tests out there. And there are a couple of new things about cellobios. So cellobios, is actually just two glucose molecules joined, but joined in such a way that you can't really digest them. So cellobios normally passes into the colon and where it will have a prebiotic, prebiotic effect that will then be metabolized by colonic bacteria. But being a relatively small molecule, right, we're looking at a disaccharide, a double sugar. Um, what you will find is that sometimes when you have these surface cells in the small intestine, if they're damaged from, say, inflammation or other causes, what you might get is also that you get transcellular absorption outside control. So if you get sufficient damage to the cells in the small intestine, you might have two problems. You might have not just things that leak in between the cracks, so you want to have, say, you know, antigen or unwanted matter, but you might also have damage to the extent that you'll actually have some of these unwanted molecules leaking through the cells themselves, not just slipping in between the cracks, but going through the cell. And so cellobios is a really good marker of small intestinal damage and not just problems with the tight junctions where things can sort of slip in between the cracks, but damage to the extent that things go straight through. And so usually when you have when you see that cellobios, that's an indication of quite severe small intestinal damage. So if you were to take a celiac still eating gluten, you know, then they would probably have elevated cellobios as well. So and I could see already when I just screened some of the questions in the chat, someone said. That my, I had a test done that showed not just increased paracellular absorption, but also intracellular or, um, absorption. And so that's what you get here. And so if you have increased levels of cellobios, that means there's probably an issue going on with inflammation. And it's most likely duodenal, right? Uh, or in the duodenum or the jejunum. Um, so in some of the first two parts of the small intestine. So we have the first part here, the duodenum, and then the jejunum, which is the second part here, and then at the down the, the lower small intestine, the ileum. So when you see elevated levels of cellobios, that usually suggests that you have damage 
already in the initial part of the small intestine uh, and quite severe damage. Now, uh, I think we need to take tech lessons from you. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> no, this presentation is great, and uh, it's, software, yeah, it, software is really cool. It is. It, it's just called graphic, uh, but it's so nice. Uh, and it's all. I actually do a lot of lecturing this way because then I can sort of respond on the spot when people have questions. So, so I'm, I'm not just a nutrition physiology nerd, I'm a bit of an IT nerd as well. Um, now the other thing that's measured, another one here, is raffinose. So raffinose is a trisaccharide. So it's a triple sugar. And again, raffinose usually is not absorbed. So if your epithelial junctions are tight, raffinose cannot make its way through. But if you have increased permeability, then, and here we're looking at the paracellular, so in between the cells, then raffinose levels go up. So, so the neat thing about the Nordic IPA is, back to the test result again, yeah, is that you can actually look at different kinds of permeability. So you can look at the mannitol level to see if, you if your absorption is impaired. You can look at cellobios, which tells you whether there's damage in this, to the small intestine to the extent that things are not just leaking in between cells, they're actually also going through cells. Um, and usually due to inflammation or severe destruction. And then raffinose, which if there are high levels of raffinose compared to mannitol, so suggests that there's also uh, you know, an, an excessive absorption and a lot of, of paracellular absorption. And then you get other markers that, which is quite neat because you also, when you do it with the IPA test from Nordic, you're also given a bit of lactose. Of course, people have to be aware of that. If they're lactose intolerant, and they want to do the test, they might have to suffer for a day or two the symptoms of, um, of lactose, um, you know, and so, and, and again, usually you shouldn't be able to recover lactose, but if you do recover lactose, um, then you also know that there's an issue with lactose intolerance, either primary or secondary. So that sells you, and then sucrose, and this one's interesting, so that's table sugar, right? So sucrose, of course, normally, good old table sugar, so we have glucose, bound to glucose, and that's usually digested quite quickly. So usually sucrose, within a short time, is split into two separate glucose molecules that are then absorbed quickly in the upper small intestine. Um, so if you ingest sucrose and you have elevated levels coming out in urine, then that's going to suggest damage to either you actually have increased stomach permeability because, right, remember, sucrose is going to be digested in your duodenum. So you can actually not only look at gut permeability in this test, but also gastric permeability. So if you have high sucrose levels, then you know that your, your stomach itself, also there's some sort of inflammation and increased permeability due to helicobacter pylori or NSAIDs or other things that not, will not just do damage to your small intestine, the large intestine, but potentially also to your stomach. Or it might also indicate damage to the duodenum, so the first part. So if you have high sucrose levels and you also have um, high levels of cellobios, then you might also have an issue with damage already in the duodenum. And you know, so here again, this this it's not going to tell you whether sucrose is a problem in terms of blood sugar regulation or bloating, but it will tell you that if you eat sucrose and get a bit of table sugar and it actually comes out in urine undigested, then you must have absorbed it at the very top of your digestive tract, either your stomach or your small intestine. 
And so therefore, the test also gives you a marker for gastric permeability. The right diagram here. Um, so, so as you can see, um, if sucrose is high, or if you have sucrose intolerance uh, as a second, you know, a, a, as a secondary problem to inflammation uh, in the small intestine. So the sucrose will show you two things when you look at it compared to the raffinose. It will tell you um, whether there is a problem with sucrose intolerance, and then if you look at the amounts on their own, then it will tell you about gastric absorption uh, and, and, and gastric permeability. So actually, this test helps you target if there are issues in not just the small intestine with increased permeability, but also in the stomach itself. And so I find that really interesting because it can help me, when I use it clinically, it can help me target and tailor treatment much more effectively. And also, of course, if you detect intestinal permeability, you're still going to, or gastric permeability, you're still going to have to find out why, I mean, what's causing it. Um, and so if you get any marks of gastric permeability, of course, the first thing I think of is helicobacter. And people might not have stomach ulcers. So helicobacter, remember, if you look at the sort of, if you were to do like a continuum of from good to bad with helicobacter, then over here, some, in some instances, helicobacter might actually be good. So in some people, it seems to attenuate allergies and atopic disease. But, and then over here, you have a stomach ulcer or a, a, a duodenal ulcer if it's really bad. But in between here, you can have gastric upset or gastric dysfunction. Uh, increased gastric permeability, either excess stomach acid or low stomach acid. So whenever I get these tests where I see that there's something with gastric permeability, I always go back and check if people have to go back to pylori, and then I'll treat it if um, they have symptoms and it's there and the gastric permeability is increased. But if you find helicobacter pylori in someone who has no symptoms and who does not have signs of increased gastric permeability, so if you find someone with a test result, not like this one, but let's say in this patient we found helicobacter pylori, but the reading was down here, then I still probably wouldn't treat it. So, you know, so when you start looking at this, it's, it's, you know, it's five tracers, uh, that are given, and when you look at the interplay between them, you actually get this really nice matrix for determining what sort of problems might be going on. You still have to, again, then find the causes, but you can sit down with the results, and then you can look at this matrix and get a much more thorough idea of what problem the problem is or what problems are going on. looking at the interrelationship between some of these different markers. So high lactose, high raffinose, then there's lactose intolerance, but it's secondary to something that causes damage to the small intestine. If lactose is normal, but raffinose is high, then there's damage to the small intestine, but you seem to be okay with lactose. If lactose is elevated, but raffinose is low, then there's primary lactose intolerance. In other words, there's a genetic reason for it. If both sucrose and raffinose are high, there's damage to the small intestine all the way up in the duodenum. And if it's just sucrose, then it's the gastric mucosa, right? So you can, you know, when you start looking at all these things, you can actually get a much more um, detailed look at what's going on in your digestive system. Then, of course, you're still going to have to find out why and treat. So when you look at this myriad of different possibilities, again, if we go back to the list of what things can cause increased gut permeability uh, or intestinal permeability. A lack of any of these nutrients. So it might be as simple as nutrient deficiencies 
or multiple nutrient deficiencies, or any of these triggers, stress, whether it's mental or phys physiological or both, sleep, a lack of sleep, overtraining, no training, too much alcohol, and that would sort of roughly be more than one serving a day on average. Extensive use of NSAI, NSAIDs. We could also add smoking, of course, is uh, quite bad, especially to your gastric mucosa. Uh, Pro-inflammatory diet, infections or dysbiosis, junk food, though they would all cause it. Um, thinking if there's anything else. Of course, also anything that interferes with stomach acids. So a lot of these and acids that are given, irregardless of the method. And of course, if you eat foods that you're allergic or intolerant to, that might also uh, cause issues where you get secondary increased intestinal permeability or gastric permeability. So there's still a lot of things to do. And of course, the other uh, thing to consider is which can be a, a marker of intestinal permeability is endotoxemia. So if you can see that you find elevated levels of endotoxin in a blood sample or urine test, then you most likely have increased you know, gut permeability as well. But it might still be nice to find out why or, uh, and, and find the specific reasons and do something. And of course, also, here when we're looking at gut permeability and endotoxemia, remember that at least for some people, saturated fat seems to cause issues as well. Not everyone. So. Uh, as an example, this client whose test result I showed you, that's an, uh, that's an old one we looked at, but, um, but uh, I had a session with him today. So this, is, this client has uh, some sort of inflammatory bowel disease. At the time, it hadn't been determined whether that was Crohn's or colitis. Uh, now, most likely been confirmed as colitis. And for him, saturated fat actually causes all sorts of problems. So when he eats high-fat dairy products, when he eats ghee, butter, uh, lots of animal you know, protein uh, with all the fat like lamb, that triggers his symptoms. That actually makes things worse. But then I have other patients with chronic inflammatory bowel disease who do wonderfully on a low-carb, high-quality high protein and also higher-fat diet. So. Saturated fat can be a problem, but it's not necessarily a problem. So I think that's uh, that's probably a um, a pretty good overview of uh, the test and intestinal permeability. So yeah, that's a that's great that was a great overview. Very yeah. comprehensive, and it, it's. What's really unique about it from what I've seen with different permeability tests or gut, leaky gut type tests is the versatility of it and the different specific results you can interpret based on the combination of results to give you like a really specific approach for, for working yeah. on something or treating something. Exactly. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, there's never going to be any single test that will tell you everything. You explained, uh, well, could you just, just for a second, uh, we've got my gut, this was assessed via a Cyrex panel, but my gut is leaking through the transcellular pathway. How is this yeah. different from the paracellular pathway? You, you talked about this a little bit during your presentation, but could you just for yeah. a second so, explain that again? So again, so, so the, two, the, the difference between the two is transcellular and paracellular is, is whether it's in between the cells or through the cells, right? So let's just get this up going. So, Paracellular is where you actually have problems with the tight junctions. So you have things that are leaking in between cells in the surface of the small intestine or potentially your stomach as well. Transcellular means through. In other words, if you have increased transcellular then we're looking at damage to the small intestine, usually from severe inflammation or infection, uh, hypopathogenic load. So you actually have unwanted things that pass through the cells. So now you're not only getting some of the nutrients you might want, like glucose or zinc or 
uh, vitamin D or vitamin E, but you are also getting uh, all sorts of antigenic and unwanted molecules and toxic and metabolically active molecules you don't want in your bloodstream, you don't want to get contact with your immune system going through. Okay, that makes sense. Um, would severe candida or yeast or really any dysbiotic infection of organisms that consume sugar potentially alter the results of the test that you're aware of? Oh, you popped mm -hmm. up. Graham, do you know well, that? Oh, wait, you are here. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, they will, they will dirt. Certainly, if you have dysbiosis, it will probably add to the test because severe dysbiosis will at some point cause enough irritation so you get increased parasitic absorption and if it's really bad usually if you go from the step, the step of dysbiosis to outright infection then you'll get transcendent absorption as well. Um, I'd say the other thing to consider with uh, when you're looking at dysbiosis uh, also small you know upper small intestinal bacterial overgrowth you might sometimes get what we could call false negatives. So let's say you have a test like this where there's no sign of a problem of lactose and no problem of a sign of sucrose when you're looking at pure digestion. But you could still have clients or patients who report, when I have lactose or when I have sucrose, then I feel worse. And so that would be because you can have things that happen before absorption. So you know, if you have the digestive tract here, uh, and we have some lactose. Of course, if you have dysbiosis where the dysbiotic microorganisms gobble up lactose and that makes them more active so they get worse, then you might not have lactose leaking through on the test, but you would still get problems of lactose, not because it's you know, there's something with intestinal permeability, but simply because it's been gobbled up by gut micro, dysbiotic gut micro. And the same thing for sucrose. You have people who, when you do the test, uh, the markers for sucrose, both gastric permeability and sucrose intolerance, look perfectly normal, but they will still report when they have table sugar and, and, and uh, sucrose from any source, they still get a lot of bloating and distension not because it's going, to, it's being absorbed, or because necessarily because of intestinal permeability, but because the gut microbes that will metabolize it way before it touches the surface of your small intestine, or might manage to sort of leak through. That also makes total sense. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Bob says, "What?" Intestinal permeability test would you recommend for diabetics, like for type 1? I don't know if there's enough sugar in this test to actually cause a problem for diabetics. Is that a concern? Mm, I wouldn't be worried because the amounts are, I mean, the amounts are really small. And also remember what's going through here is sucrose, so it's actually unmetabolized, uh, you know, uh, table sugar. Uh, uh, I mean, so, so it's not, it's not, not, I mean, the amounts are really small, so that's not going to get you in trouble. Uh, so you can, if you're diabetic, you can do it. It's not going to give you massive reactive hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia, because the amounts are so small anyway. That makes sense. Uh, can transcellular leakage be healed? Yes, it can, but you're going to have to go back to the... You're going to have to find out what's causing the transcellular leakage, so... If you have, you no know, right, when you usually look at the epithelium, if you were to draw a sort of more realistic life, like then you have the microvilli, so they look kind of like this when everything is fine, but then when you have damage, you get flattened microvilli, and you also get, so then you're going to have to find out why is this happening? Why is the damage so extensive? You have mutants going through, so that could be due to dysbiosis. It could be due to gluten, if you have undiagnosed gluten intolerance of some form, whether it's celiac disease or not. Uh, it could be due to alcohol, an excess of alcohol, of course. It could be due to um, NSAIDs. In a worst-case scenario, they're not just going to cause paracellular, but also transcellular problems, uh, or, of course, an outright infection. So, first of all, you're going to have to 
do some problem solving and see if there's anything going on causing extensive damage. And then all the things we talk about for gut healing would be good. So zinc, carnosine, uh, L-glutamine would be good. Uh, vitamin A would be good. Probiotics would be good. Aloe vera. Um, Bone broth would be good as well, uh, you know. So, so, so even for when you have transcellular, you first of all, you know, of course, when I also call it transcellular, it's chemotherapy. Um, if you're on chemotherapy or radiotherapy as well, where you get really extensive damage to the surface of the small intestine. So find out what the triggers are, and then of course do go as aggressively as you need to with the healing protocol to get there. Um, so it's, it's certainly possible, and of course you do the same thing if it's paracellular, you also look for all these causes, um, but usually paracellular absorption happens before transcellular, you need a, you should, you can, you know, it's not 100% precise, but ru you can roughly say that you will have, when you have transcellular absorption, then you have a greater degree of damage and more inflammation than if it's just paracellular. All right, Denise, I hope that answers your question. We've got, um, who should take this test, those with symptoms or everyone? I Personally, I don't have anyone that doesn't have symptoms do lab testing. But, um, I mean, unless yeah. there's something they want to optimize or, like, they run a test and they see, oh, I'm super deficient in this or that or whatever. But generally, people aren't running labs and investigating their health too much when they feel great. No, um, I yeah, and I'd agree, and also, I mean, my experience is that if you run labs, you'll probably find some things that are off, even if people don't have symptoms or pathology, and then it's really a question, do you treat that? You know, if, 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 if you were to take 100 random people off the street and test them for intestinal permeability or organic acids in urine or uh, their gut microbiome or pretty much anything, you probably find some of them where things sort of look wrong, but they don't have any symptoms uh, or any disease history. And then, you know, if you start treating that aggressively, are you then doing overtreatment? Kind of like with, if you take a hundred random people off the street and test them for herniated discs, you're probably going to find that about thirty of those will have herniated discs, but it might only be two or three out of those hundred that actually have symptoms. So now, what do you do with the remaining? 27 or 28, do you now start aggressive surgical treatment and so forth? That, I, in my opinion, that would be overkill. So I, I completely agree with you that going, doing, um, you know, not for in general, just lab testing everyone for everything seems to be a bit, uh, a bit too uh, aggressive. I've seen opinion. people that feel great and find something on a lab test, and then all of a sudden they don't feel great because they know what was on their lab test. So. Um, exactly, yeah. yeah. And, 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 that, and, that, and that comes back to that sort of, uh, you know, the same thing. If you, if you do, if you look for people, if you look at their joints and their spine and so forth, you'll actually get people who will then say, well, actually, we found herniated discs and they'd be perfectly fine. They're like, oh, I have back pain. Oh, no, I have decreased mobility. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in completely in agreement with that. All right. Karen, what is your favorite supplement for gut healing? I know he listed about a dozen to maybe even more during the webinar presentation. I don't know if there's a favorite. That's probably pretty individual and based on where their issues are, but... Exactly, yeah. But I'd say, I mean, zinc, carnosine, L-glutamine, aloe vera, probiotics, um, EGL as well, e-glutamine is a nice licorice, uh, I have a lot of my clients who have increased permeability use that with great success. And then if there are any signs of inflammation, then things like curcumin, boswellia, some of these pretty potent herbal anti-inflammatories, right? Because you, it's kind of what's the chicken, what's the egg? Is it inflammation leading to permeability? That might be the case sometimes. Or permeability that then triggers inflammation. 
and you never know. Um, so sometimes you're also going to have to test a few things, different combinations, until you find what works best for the individual patient. Uh, does I, I don't fully understand this question, so I'm just going to read it exactly how it was written. Does the Nordic test do the same transcellular test function, low versus high mannitol, as low yeah. means blunted brush border and high means leaky gut, like on a biohealth IP? Yeah, it does. So let me just. I figured as much. So if you look at it, if you look at the. So it's here, right? Absorption capacity. So here we're looking at mannitol. So if you have a high, you know, high levels, that's good, meaning brush border capacity is good, or low, meaning that your ability to actively absorb nutrients is impaired. So that is done. That's that's the first marker on the test. That's what I thought. I just wanted to have you answer it. <laughs> Uh, this will be available as a recording for those who are asking. There's a functional lab series section on the member dashboard on the site. When you're logged in as a free or premium member, it will go in there. So you don't have to remember every single thing he's saying right now. You'll be able to watch it. Um, issues with glutamine converting to glutamates. Um, I've seen that in about with excitotoxicity with glutamine. I've seen that with about three people in eight years. Yeah. Um, so it is something that happens, but it's really rare, at least in my experience. And um, it's pretty much just if they react negatively to glutamine, don't give it to them. It's never going to be like a, a life-threatening situation or anything actually no. dangerous. Yeah. And I, I see the same with glutamine to glutamate, so they get like excitotoxicity. Mm -hmm. Also, I see some people who, at least if they go to high end glutamine, instead of helping with gut issues, it increases inflammation because glutamine is a nutrient for the white blood cells. So, I, you know, I've seen clients who, with inflammatory bowel disease, and they do low do those glutamine, they feel better. And then they think, well, if 2 grams or 5 grams is good, then 15 or 20 grams or 30 grams is probably 10 times better. <laughs> and then you actually get inflammation. The same thing goes for aloe vera, which because aloe vera has constituents that help decrease inflammation and heal, you know, uh, mucous membranes and the endothelium, but it's also an immune stimulant. And so I've seen clients who did really well with one or two tablespoons of high quality aloe vera juice or aloe gel. And then they thought, well, in that case, you know, probably like half a cup would be ten times better, and that just made things worse. Um, here, the dose makes the poison. Can you take off your screen share, at least for now, so people can see your yeah. smiling face while answering the questions? <laughs> All right. Um, so long story short, how concerned am I about L-glutamine converting to glutamate? It's not very. There's also a question whether, with mannitol says something about transcellular permeability. Yeah, um, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, and then it does. So remember, mannitol is absorbed on purpose. So mannitol will just tell you whether you have good proactive absorption of nutrients or not. So if you have high mannitol, that's separate from the cellobios, which will tell you something about things that leak transcellular through your cells when it's not on purpose. So mannitol and zone will just help you identify good absorption of a proactive absorption of nutrients or bad. Cellobios will tell you more about whether there is um, actual unwanted nutrient absorption or not antigenic absorption going on through, through your cells due to extensive damage and inflammation. All right, we got about one more. I got to jump on a podcast recording in four minutes. So, um, yeah. Does leaky gut or this permeability or damage here uh, cause white blood cell counts to be low? Mm, well, I mean, in a worst case scenario, it might actually cause that problem because, um, you know, any, any sort of long term drawn out immune provocation, whatever you want to call it, might actually uh, lead to, um, you know, that, that might actually lead to your immune system eventually becoming depressed. So it, it, could, it could also go the other way and lead to 
white blood cells going high, but almost like if you look at stress, right, initially people are subjected if there are too many, too, too many stressors, then their stress hormones go high, and at some point when they sort of crash and burn, and burn out, then they become really low because you've been in overdrive for an extended period of time. So it can go both ways, but we, usually if you've had permeability due to severe dysbiosis for a long time, at the end you might actually have uh, your white blood cells go low. Or you might have nutrient malabsorption that leads to white low blood cells, low absorption of zinc and vitamin A and some of these nutrients that are important for immune function. All right. On that note, thank you for that. I'm going to have to draw this to a conclusion. Uh, judging by the con questions that continue to come in, uh, we would love to have you back in the future, do some q and I'm sure we're going to we're going to work with more Nordic tests um, also, and we'll do a webinar when we bring out new tests, so I'm sure um, yeah. we can do that then, but maybe a, a, another Q&A on this one in the future. I'm going to throw up the link. We just um, made this test available uh, on our site for people to order, and you can order it as a standalone where you'll get the, in, the interpretation report that comes with the test. is actually... As far as lab test interpretation reports go, it's very easy to read, very clear, very concise, where we didn't even feel we needed to change it, modify it, edit it, clarify it, or anything like that. So the test is available on its own with the report or also um, with a consult with some recommendations that will be with Mike Kuhn, who I believe is signed into this right now. But I'm going to post the link right there for anyone, and we'll have it linked in the follow-up email. It's on the website, too, if you're at the top, or professional services. If you scroll down, it'll say functional gut tests right there. Um, we have the kits on their way to Jessica, our assistant, who ships all of our products. Uh, she's going to be sending them out as the orders come in. Uh, can you just go through real quick the, um, the, the process of taking it, just a very brief from... Yeah taking it to shipping it to when results come in, stuff like that. Yeah. Graeme, do you want to do that? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite simple, obviously. Once the, uh, once, the, once the client have ordered it from you guys and, it, and the test gets delivered, um, they, they take the drink before bed. Um, so they drink the sugars. And then first thing in the morning when they, they get up, you know, roughly eight hours later, they're, they're going to collect all that urine um, into the, the container. And then basically they're going to just take the, the enclosed pipette and move some of that urine into the included test tube. Um, and then literally they're just going to package that up and send it back and then obviously that we're going to run the analysis and then give the results. Cool. And how long about does it take to come? Like three weeks you said about to get results? Yeah, so the, the laboratory, is typically it's a bit slower um, with these results than, than, than other tests. So it, it takes us about three weeks to, to, to turn those around. Okay, so we, we just say to people, look, uh, be patient and we'll get those back to you as soon as we can, but we're looking about a three-week turnaround time. Okay, that's great. Um, and we'll have all those details, too. The, the, the page that I linked here has tons of details about the test. Uh, I have access to these guys if I need to, so we can pass along questions there. Mike's going to be helping us, and Graham is training Mike on the test, so he'll be doing the consults and recommendations and things for people who want that and um, always you can just shoot your questions to us and we can pass them along to those who can answer so uh, thank you so much for that presentation it was awesome and now I have new software that I want <laughs> thank you. Uh, I don't have a Mac though so Joe would have to get it but I we need something we can draw on during presentations because that was, yeah. that was really great and you're an excellent teacher so kudos thank you thank you thank you all right. Thanks, everyone. We will be back at you soon, and uh, thanks for joining us.